The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, good afternoon. This is uh, Byron King, South Carolina Association of Realtors. This forum's webinar is brought to you by REF, Realtor Education Foundation. Uh, this is Byron King in Columbia, the State Association of Realtors. I'm Senior Vice President General Counsel for the SCR Trade Association. Uh, my email is byron at screaltors.org. Our toll-free number 800-233-6381. I'll repeat that uh, during the uh, broadcast as well. Um, just wanted to get a quick intro on this. This is uh, you're looking at uh, a proposed contract the executive committee uh, recently approved. Uh, it was about a three-year project. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, SCR Forums Chair uh, Beth Ross from Myrtle Beach, who initiated it uh, about three years ago. Uh, Charleston's Corwin Millette, that was Forums Chair after Beth, and the current Forums Chair Nancy Nelson from Columbia. And just to kind of give you an idea of how long this project's been going on, so you won't think that it was. Uh, done too quickly. The intern that gathered uh, contracts from across the United States uh, for us to start this project is now a, a lawyer in Florida. The exec, like I said, the executive committee has approved this draft. Uh, the SCR Legal Action Committee uh, helped with this draft and it will probably go into use sometime this summer or early fall. And uh, another reminder, as realtor members you have access to zip forms that gives you access to zip vault, zip form zip vault. Uh, Zipforms Digital Inc. Uh, and Zipforms Mobile. Zipforms can actually replace your uh, paper files. You can store in the cloud. Uh, you can use it to replace your FedEx and UPS uh, shipping cost uh, by emailing it with secure uh, signatures from the clients. And then uh, I wanted to go into why we updated the form with the uh, forms committees under Beth Ross, Cole Millette, and Nancy Nelson have worked on this form. Uh, we periodically update the form based on uh, case law, hotline calls. Uh, we started to see a trend across the United States for due diligence. That's the main change. This form is basically the current contract with a due diligence addendum. And also we've been seeing in the state of South Carolina, you probably have seen it too, what I call a homemade due diligence where you have agents handwriting or typing into a contract. Um, you know, this contract's uh, contingent or subject to the buyer's, you know, complete satisfaction with home inspection or any kind of a trigger like that where it gives the buyer unilateral right to terminate the agreement. In North Carolina has adopted due diligence so the Rock Hill Realtors have been using that and report liking it. Also there were some cases that have limited liability for real estate agents so we've incorporated those and since the last update there's some big some big changes and you'll hear me use the term UPL that stands for a felony crime in South Carolina, the unauthorized practice of law. In some states, uh, real estate agents, realtors are not allowed to fill in the blanks on a contract. Uh, they have to take the contract to an attorney. Uh, this obviously adds a lot, weeks of delay and thousands of dollars. So in an effort to protect our right in South Carolina form fill contracts, there's been some UPL protections added here. And three things really changed uh, dramatically since the last uh, contract update. Uh, UPL law, unauthorized practice of law, uh, was updated by the General Assembly, allowing it to be a crime even outside the courtroom, to pretend to be a lawyer outside of the courtroom is now UPL. Uh, there was a case uh, where uh, a contract, it was actually a refinance contract, was voided by the court because they said the bank had closed the home equity line of credit without an attorney, which is illegal in South Carolina, and the, and the judge said, if uh, unauthorized practice of law is part of the uh, agreement, um, then the contract's void. So that gives, a, gives an incentive for a party or a lawyer trying to defeat a real estate contract to try to accuse you guys of unauthorized practice of law. And then in a, it was actually an arrest of an upstate real estate agent for unauthorized practice of law. So it is, some, it is a threat. So that's been incorporated. There's some UPL threats incorporated into the contract. And your license law prohibits you from the unauthorized practice of law. And Article 13 of your Code of Ethics basically says realtors shall not engage in activities that constitute the unauthorized practice of law and shall recommend that legal counsel be obtained when the interest of any party the transaction requires it. So South Carolina real estate closing is the practice of law, so that's why you have to close with an attorney. 
and it's not a great leap to imagine that the South Carolina Supreme Court, under if a case got to them where some buyer or seller was damaged, or what a real estate agent had written into a form of saying, hey, this contract is so central to the real estate transaction closing, which is the practice of law, um, you know, drafting contract language by handwriting or typing into a contract beyond just a mere scrivener filling in, you know, information blanks was the practice of law. So that's what we've, we're trying to protect your right to fill out these forms in South Carolina. Um, and then also kind of going back to Beth Ross's committee, the original committee three years ago, they worked with a large Columbia law firm to produce the initial draft. The idea being, you know, Byron King, Nick Kermitis, uh had been working on the old form so much that they were too close to it to get an outside set of eyes on it. And this uh, draft you're looking at is basically a refinement of that, that work that Beth Ross's committee began uh, about two years ago. And some of you may have attended classes last year in 2012. We did classes on the forum in October, November, and December to kind of uh, educate you as well as to draw information from you. It's one of the largest outreach programs we've done at SCR. And a lot of good feedback from all you guys uh, went into this, and a lot of it's been incorporated into this draft. Those classes back in the fall took about two hours to teach. So in respect to everybody on the webinar, this uh, hour format, I'm going to go through the form. I'll stay, uh, Michael Christ and I'll stay on the line. He's the uh, producer of this uh, broadcast uh, to answer any questions, but we'll wrap up in an hour. So I'm going to ask you to hold your questions or you can email them to byron at screaltors.org. And like I said, I'll stay on after the hour as long as we need to. But in respect to everybody's time, I'm going to go through the contract uh, within the hour. Kind of some quick updates. Make sure that you get uh, your license checked with LLR and a broker's in charge check. Make sure everybody renews in time for June 30th. They split the population of licensees. The old rule of thumb, A through K or all through Z, is not 100% accurate. Um, your CE done on this CE. We've got a couple of associations that are working on getting this form into a CE format. Uh, Charleston, Myrtle Beach, Western Upstate, Anderson, Diana Brothers. Uh, Sumter are all working on getting a contract class. Uh, Charleston Trident actually has a class scheduled for May 31st in the last two weeks in June uh, per uh, demand. And some of the larger brokerages are also working on some CE for you guys. Update on the seller disclosure, another three-year project. Uh, thanks to the task force that uh, LLR realtors that worked on, Commissioner David Krigler of Greenville, uh, Realtor Jim Smith, uh, Realtor Fritzy Barber, uh, Columbia Association Executive Sharon Young, Columbia Attorney Gary Pickering, uh, Columbia Real Estate Agent Margaret Ann Ashburn, and Commissioner Attorney out of Charleston Hamlin of Kelly have developed a, a seller disclosure draft you may have seen. It's on the LLR website, and they're going to take it up in the next Real Estate Commission May 22nd, so get your, in, your input into LLR on that to vote to Another quick update, and all these are related to the contract while I'm going through them. Uh, flood insurance, we've got a webinar archived on the flood insurance issue. We've been seeing, you know, up to a thousand percent increases in flood insurance. It's an issue that the coast has brought up and as recently as yesterday, uh, Nick Kermitis and Michael Lee were up in the upstate. Michael Lee's our new attorney uh, and even the upstate are experiencing some issues with flood insurance. And the due diligence, I think, will be a useful tool for this issue as we go forward. And then finally on the updates, the uh, CL100, we've been getting a lot of calls about you know, shortening the time span from 45 to 30 days, uh, who can opine on uh, damage, and, uh, and Clemson is obviously the regulatory authority, and there's some provisions in the contract that help deal with some of those issues. And moving forward, what you're looking at is a copyright uh, SCR contract. Uh, it's basically the same as the old contract, except for the uh, due diligence addendum that we'll cover. The contract's basically the same. Uh, it's designed to work with that due diligence addendum, so in addition to the financing contingency being a standalone contingency, the appraisal contingency being standalone, the termite is actually standalone now, and you may wonder why it's not wrapped in together with the pairs. It's because if you use the due diligence addendum, uh, the termite uh, was outside, mainly because of that 45 to 30 day change. We had to be able to get that termite letter. Because uh, due diligence is envisioned to be a 10 to 15 type business day. That's what they're using in Rock Hill, North Carolina, uh, up there. They're the North Carolina due diligence form. But with that termite date, we moved that up. You know, that was kind of the feed, one of the feedback from when, last fall was to move that uh, separate. And also part of the contract, uh, we've got some liability limitations that came up in case law. I think you'd be excited about. 
and then hotline issues. Again, if you need to contact the SCR legal hotline, toll free 800-233-6381. Uh, my email is byron, B-Y-R-O-N, at screaltors.org. And like I mentioned, the other attorneys at the association that also staff the hotline, in addition to Byron King, are uh, Michael Lee, new attorney, and uh, our, your CEO, Nick Reminds. Also, we've uh, uh, mediation is in the contract, and NER has the School of Mediation in Chicago. If you're interested, that'll be June 27th, 28th, and 29th of this year, if you're interested, go on. You mentioned due diligence. It's in the North Carolina state contract. Uh, North Carolina, the bar and the realtors work together and design the due diligence uh, part of their contract. And the realtors in Rock Hill report uh, loving it and using it. It's kind of controversial on the coast, uh, Myrtle Beach and Beaufort particularly. Beaufort uh, came around to it a little bit with a fee involved. So the fee's been involved. You know, you'll see that when we get to the due diligence addendum. And it, like I said, it'll be good for some of these uh, flood insurance issues to give the buyer time to investigate uh, flood insurance costs they're going to be facing. And if it was too much, they could obviously terminate under the due diligence addendum. So let's get started. Uh, again, it's similar to the current SCR 310. Um, and uh, we've given this presentation to hundreds of realtors. And I'll try to address some of the common concerns, issues, and questions as I go along. Uh, many of the issues are issues of preference. Uh, for example, something uh, one board, uh, everybody would want me to change it in the draft, we change it, the next board would want it the other way. So a lot of it's preference, uh, just remember you can't please everybody, and obviously you can write a contract to favor the buyer or the seller, and the SCR philosophy is to try to get in that middle ground that you would arrive at, you know, negotiating back and forth anyway, even starting with a contract that was much more favorable to the uh, buyer. So. All right, so uh, SCR 310. SCR 310, so we're looking at this form here on your screen. You can follow along. Uh, agreement contract to buy and sell real estate residential. Notice below it, uh, draft do not use. This is not the SCR form. Do not use this yet. Um, you're Main reason you use state forms, one, they're uniform, so you don't have to read every comma and period in the uh, document. You can read it one time and be comfortable with what's in there. Uh, the other thing is your E&O insurance. A lot of the E&O insurers require you to use uh, uh, an association-approved form. So that's one reason to be able to use it is for the E&O issue as well as the uniformity. So paragraph one, parties, you know, pretty simple, buyer and seller name. Uh, one issue here that we get a lot of hotline calls about is you want to have buyers that are anonymous um, and we recommend you hire an attorney to, to sign for them. Real estate agents should avoid signing for their clients. Clients can hire an attorney to draft a specific power of attorney for a trusted friend or relative of the client. Um, licensed parties, that's a checkbox below by statute, must disclose their licensee status even if you're only a partner or a member of a corporation that's a buyer or seller. The next section one our definitions A, B, C, D, E, and F, and G. Uh, a defines the party, that's either the buyer or the seller. Uh, parties refers to both of them in the document. Brokers are the licensed uh, South Carolina brokers in charge and their associated real estate licensees and their sub-agents. Uh, closing attorney is the licensed South Carolina attorney selected by the buyer to coordinate the transaction and closing. Effective date, this is an important thing to notice. Uh, this is kind of a change from what we've been doing. This is going to be kind of the trigger date that any of the uh, clocks start on. It's the final date upon which a party of the negotiation places the final and required signatures and or initials and date on this contract and delivers notice to cause this contract to be binding on all parties. And notice and delivery are defined toward the end of the contract. Uh, basically means it has to be in writing, either electronic or paper writing. Delivery means you get it to the other side and they're aware of uh, the delivery. Uh, business days, a 24-hour period, and a little bit different than usual. It starts at 10 a.m. This would give you on the you know the last day, it would at least allow you to get into the lawyer's office uh, by 10 a.m. That's defined Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and counted from 10 a.m. of the first business day following the effective date. Um, business day shall not begin, end on a Saturday, Sunday, or federal legal holiday. So the idea being, um, you know, you would always be able to get in that lawyer's office the last day. Uh, to try to get that closing done. And good funds, this kind of goes, uh, the SC bar, you guys have seen this happening where uh, attorneys 
Um, talk about good funds, that, you know, it impacts how the money has to get into the escrow account. They can't just take paper checks during the day of closing and, and, and disperse. They have to make sure there's good funds in their account. So kind of borrowing from that, good funds is defined as the transfer uh, required amount of United States dollars uh, within any required time frame. And then uh, G, time, all time stated shall be South Carolina local time. It covers daylight savings time. And then case law, you have to say time is of the essence with respect to all provision of this contract stipulating time, deadline, or performance period. That's uh, an old court case that basically said you had to do that to be able to make those dates enforceable. Uh, paragraph two, purchase price, you know, dollars, write it in letters if you want to, USD sends for US dollars, and it's payable by a combination of financing and cash or cash, payment shall be in good funds. And then uh, the next section is important because um, it talks about the sale of the buyer's real property is or is not required for the purchase of this this purchase for purchase and this contingency terms are or not attached. You can get a lot of calls where a buyer would have uh, you know that contingency uh, contingent on the sale of their home to buy the property. Another offer comes in, seller wants to move to it, and the buyers were just um, removing that contingency. It was kind of a, a fiction. They really did still need to sell it, and then they were using the financing clause. Uh, to still uh, protect them on that. So to prevent some of that, we've updated those documents um, so that the uh, the buyers on the hook, if they if they're going to remove that contingency, then they need to be able to really buy that property without selling it, not just make that fiction up. So that's why that's been uh, updated. In paragraph three. Uh, the property seller will sell and buyer will buy for the purchase price any all lot land, any all lot or parcel of land, pertinent interest, improvements, landscape, systems and fixtures, if any, thereon, and further described below. That's defined as the property, so it's basically the dirt improvements. Uh, the seller agrees to maintain the property, any personal property conveying in working order, including any landscaping grounds and any agreed upon repairs or replacements from the effective date through closing, subject to normal wear and tear, uh, buyer is solely responsible for inquiring about lease issues, part of signing contract, if there's a tenant, et cetera. Lease issues uh, refers to the adjustment paragraph that we'll get to in a little bit for rent, uh, deposits, things like that. Other issues that involve leasing would be equipment, fuel tanks, alarm systems, maybe satellite equipment, roll carts, maybe even prorating the fuel in a tank. Uh, the address, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. Fill that in. The unit number, city, state of South Carolina. You know, you want to use this form in South Carolina, not uh, another state. Uh, the zip form, county of, lot, block, section, phase, subdivision, other. If you have a preference, how you want to describe the property, and then a blank for TMS, the tax map. Um, and it's kind of important. We talk about uh, personal property. The contract controls what transfers. So. Uh, personal properties, uh, unless it's defined here in the contract, none of the personal property conveys in a fixture. There's some case law about how it's attached, uh, how it's intended to be used. So personal property, if you really want something to convey, you need to write it in here. If you're running out of room, you could always use SCR form 390 uh, to write in more information. Uh, I've been getting some calls about buyer agents just stapling uh, an MLS data sheet to this thing. That may not be a best practice uh, for other reasons. For this reason, it might be helpful. But the uh, the downside of attaching that um, MLS data sheet, and here there's some liability protections, mainly about the square footage. It basically says, hey, the parties are only relying on what's part of the contract. So if you attach that MLS data sheet with incorrect uh, square footage on there, uh, you've lost that liability protection that we'll talk about in a little bit. So probably better just to go ahead and um, write in any personal property. That you know, personal property, obviously, you're probably not going to write everything. An inventory would take too long, but expensive items, items you really want, um, make sure those things get added into that. So any appliances, chandeliers, things like that, uh, mirrors, uh, things like that you would add in. Here we got four, conveyance, closing, possession. A closing occurs when the seller conveys property to the buyer and includes, include, occurs no later than 5 p.m. on or before, and there's a, a date there. And really, that 5 p.m. is taken into consideration. You're probably at a lawyer's office, and the parties could obviously, you know, go later than that if they needed to with agreement from everybody. And also considering in this state, 
some markets, one attorney does uh, closing for everybody. Some markets, you've got a buyer attorney and seller attorney. You always want to recommend to your clients they have their own attorney, but I understand to save money, uh, maybe market custom one attorney closes, but it's this is designed to cover both situations. And with an automatic extension of five business days for an unsatisfied contingency through no fault of either party. This really, there was some talk about getting rid of this automatic extension because it was getting abused, but kind of the feedback was, yeah, that, that's a small problem. If you take it out, you know, the lenders are really the ones causing a lot of these delays. If you take it out, it's really going to cause a problem that if you then if you leave it in. So that was kind of the discussion there. Uh, conveyance shall be fee simple, made subject to all easements, reservations, rights away, restrictive covenants of record, provided they do not make the title unmarkable or adversely affect the use and value of the property in material way to all government statutes, ordinances, rules, and permits and regulations. Seller agrees to convey the marketable title with a properly recorded general warranty deed free of encumbrances and liens except stated herein and an ownership type and names, the buyer would write their names in there or is stipulated by buyer. And again, recognizing those markets where there's two attorneys, uh, the deed would be just uh, delivered to the closing attorney's designated place on or before the closing date, no less than 10 a.m. Some markets, the lawyer's table fund, in other words, at closing, they may give you your commission check. Some markets, due to some shenanigans by sellers with the deed, they actually record the deed at the courthouse and then make sure that the closing attorney finds out the you know, quick title update, deed's recorded, and then the checks are released. That's pretty common over in Horry County. Um, so that's why that's there. Uh, seller agrees to pay all statutory deed recording fees. Uh, parties agree the broker shall have access to the closing and relevant documents. That's been some hotline calls, usually where the buyer or seller gets upset with some of the brokers and tries to block them out. This allows you to comply with license law and get copies of the settlement statement and make sure your commission's on there. And there's some things in here to protect your commission getting paid at closing, so I think you'll like that. And the broker shall be given copies of the settlement statement prior to closing for review. That's always been a rule. Uh, if you ask for it uh, 24 hours prior, the closing attorney will give you based on you know, something based on best available information, which may be pretty scant depending on what the lender's given them, but you can't ask for that. Or it could happen, you know, 10 seconds prior to closing. Uh, the seller shall convey possession of a vacant and reasonable clean property free of debris, along with any keys, codes, remote controls, available documents, example, manuals, equipment warranties, service info, et cetera, and similar ownerships to buyer at closing. Again, that's based on some hotline calls. And a major change that we've made in this contract is earnest money. That's probably our one hotline call. And as you're aware, currently, you know, the money stays in the trust account until the parties sign a, a release. Uh, the lawyer, uh, party our lawyers get a court order um, for the broker in charge volunteers to sue the buyer and the seller under interpleader. Um, and we can recognize we can never solve all the 100% of the situations, but we have put some things in here to try to help you uh, with earnest money because I know that is an issue for you guys. So it basically says the blank amount of earnest money is paid as following. Some of it may come with the offer, some of it will be paid within blank business days after the effective date, and earnest money is form of check, cash, or other wire, etc. to be a credit by our closing or disperse only as parties agree in writing. That's your release, and we've also actually come up with a new document that we'll be adding with this contract, a disbursement agreement, so you got parties that want to release their earnest money but may still want to try to sue somebody. You know, they could use it in that situation. Or by court order. That's the same way as we always do. The parties, buyer and seller, hire lawyers and go get sue each other and get a court order uh, telling you to pay the earnest money to one or the other. And here's the big change here. Or by contract. Um, that's part of license law and we've added some things here in the contract to try to help you get earnest money out. Won't solve all the problems, but it'll solve some of them. Uh, or is required for closing by the closing attorney. It's you know, a successful closing, how the attorneys transfer their earnest money over to their account. Uh, buyers and sellers authorized, you know, write the name as escrow agent. We've added some things at the end of the contract where the escrow agent acknowledges and gives some information about themselves to hold and disperse earnest money in accordance with the terms of the contract, the law, and any regulations. That's really your license law that they're talking about. Uh, brokers don't guarantee payment of a check or checks accepted as earnest money. That's the classic buyer gives you a check and it bounces scenario. So after the buyer, but not after the broker. Parties direct the escrow agent to communicate reasonable information confirming status and receipt of the earnest money upon a broker request. This is a classic thing where we get a lot of hotline calls where um, 
listing agents trying to get some sort of confirmation that there's really been a, you know, a receipt of earnest money and the uh, buyer brokerage is not uh, forthcoming. So it puts some burden into the contract uh, on the parties. And uh, in bold, parties understand and agree that under all circumstances, including default, escrow agent holding the earnest money will not disperse it to either party and to both parties that execute an agreement authorizing disbursement. That's the release, or we talked about the new form. Uh, say somebody wants to sue somebody, but they're willing to disperse the earnest money that they get. She'll use that form. Or until a court of competent ju jurisdiction is directed disbursement or otherwise agreed upon in this contract. That's the classic buyer and seller sue each other uh, in circuit court, uh, not magistrate court, uh, get a court order, uh, master and equity order, um, or the broker is suing a magistrate under interpleader. And then an uh, addition here, or is otherwise agreed upon in this contract. So that's some of the things we're going to talk about to help you get money out of your earnest money, out of your account. And then uh, after five years of closing dates, you can actually disperse the money to the South Carolina treasurer, and then they can pursue that as unclaimed property. Uh, earnest money is not going to be dispersed until determined to be good funds. So they can't put the money into your account, cancel the next day and want their money back, and then you disperse it, and their check bounces, or they were a crook, and the money uh, you know, was a fraud just to try to launder their money through your account. And here, another protection for you. If legal action occur, this could be the parties suing everybody over earnest money or your interpleader, uh, the non-prevailing party agrees to indemnify the escrow agent's fees, court costs, and attorney's fees. And then one of the things we've been getting calls on the hotline, the brokers say, hey, I would like to do interpleader or mediation to settle this thing, but I don't feel like paying 80 to $150 uh, out of my pocket to get it settled. Uh, to help that area, the party here agree to play and the put an amount of money in here, earnest money. Um, they're either going to use the portion of the earnest money or pay it to the escrow agent prior to filing interpleader or mediation as compensation, and escrow agent acknowledges duties. So that's some things to help protect you there. Six, transaction costs. This is, um, we get a lot of hotline calls of people arguing over transaction, well, called closing costs. So we've renamed it as transaction cost and define it. Buyer's transaction costs include all cost, closing costs resulting from selected financing, prepaid recurring items insurance, including mortgage insurance, title insurance, lender, owner, and hazard uh, insurance, discount points, all costs obtained information from or pertaining to an owner's association. Myrtle Beach, you guys talk about that, is the certificate of assessment. Interest, non-recurring closing costs, title exam, FHA, VA, allowable fees, fees and expenses of buyer's attorney, Here's one you guys will like, contractually required real estate broker compensation and the cost of any inspector, appraisal, or surveyor. And then the seller's transaction costs include deed prep, uh, deed reporting costs, deed stamps, tax reporting costs calculated based on the value of the property, all costs necessary to deliver marketable title and payoffs, satisfactions of mortgages, liens, and recording, property taxes prorated at closing, uh, contractually required. Again, here's your commission being brought into the contracts to the closing attorney will make sure you get paid, contractually required real estate broker compensation and fees expenses of the seller's attorney. Um, and then here it says uh, buyer will pay and buyer will pay buyer's transaction costs, seller will pay seller's transaction costs unless otherwise agreed. You have a blank there and then we're going to get to that checkbox which is a new change I think you'll like. Uh, private public transfer fees, any costs similar to transfer fees. Uh, they can be named either from capital contributions, conservancy fees, estoppel fees, otherwise named but similar fees paid at the owner's association, and then the parties select. In some markets the sellers pay it, some market the buyers pay it, so you've got an option there. Here's the thing I think you'll like in this checkbox. This is where they can agree otherwise. Um, a lot of people handwrite this in, it's a UPL risk, so this is a UPL defense for you guys. This is the checkbox where the seller can pay certain transaction costs you know, in terms of dollar amount or percentage of the purchase price, whichever is higher uh, for the buyer. So I think you'll like that. Uh, it's not in the current contract, mainly because there's usually an argument about where the, uh, you know, if you don't spend all that money, uh, where the money goes and this handles that. So this is a UPL protection. The parties would check this. It says at closing, seller will pay buyer's transaction costs not to exceed blank U.S. dollars or percent of purchase price, whichever is higher, which includes non-allowable cost first and then allowable cost. FHA, VA. Uh, buyers are responsible for anything over this amount. And if the amount, uh, the transaction cost uh, is, uh, if the amount exceeds the actual amount of these costs or amount allowed by lender, 
any excess funds revert to the seller. So that covers that usual argument. Um, seller will pay or pay for all the seller's transaction costs. Um, if it doesn't close, the seller doesn't want to be on the hook for that. So it says if there's no closing, the buyer is responsible for buyer's transaction costs and seller is responsible for seller's transaction costs. And the way this, uh, this is the first one we've seen here, but this is how you initial. Uh, that should, well, I have to make a correction. It should say buyer initial initial date uh, time and then seller initial initial uh, date year time. Uh, then paragraph seven, financing. Made a little bit of changes here, but um, we'll talk about that. And again, this is the first thing outside of because we're working with the due diligence addendum. That's out, you know, standalone financing, appraisal, and termites all standalone. Uh, paragraph seven, finance buyers under obligation in this contract is or is not contingent upon obtaining financing of a 15-year or 30-year or you know fill in the blank purchase money loan at reasonable prevailing market rates with loans. Yeah, or plural, equal in amounts of a minimum percentage and maximum percentage of purchase price or appraised value, whichever is lower. This is the financing contingency. Uh, the financing contingency expires at closing. That's your finance period. And during that period, the buyer must make timely good faith efforts to apply for and obtain financing while refraining from contrary action. That's their required financing effort got to try to get the loan. In a timely manner, the buyer shall inform seller and brokers of pertinent financing issues and authorize their lender to disclose pertinent loan information and sellers and broker financing disclosure. Um, you know, and I understand some of the banks are difficult to deal with, but this was to address some of that. If a lender declines or fails to approve financing, the buyer shall notify the seller and broker as soon as possible. And then the buyer shall apply for financing within blank business days from the effective date and shall provide the seller with reasonable written loan pre-approval documentation within blank business days from the effective date. And we, you know, getting the calls, I recognize some of these pre-approval documentation, some are rubber stamped, not really worth the paper they're written on, some have some underwriting. This is to address uh, that issue somewhat. And then if the seller and brokers are notified of inability to obtain financing during the financing period, either party may terminate this contract by notice and earnest money shall be returned to the buyer. So this is one of the first contract things to address to earnest money to try to, and won't solve all the disputes, but at least uh, say the buyer didn't get financing, uh, delivers notice to the seller uh, that, hey, I didn't get the loan. This will allow the broker to disperse earnest money in accordance with license law in this contract. So that's one uh, way to help solve some of the earnest money disputes short of mediation, uh, lawsuits, uh, lawyers, and um, our interpleader. Note it says proposed lender, so obviously uh, uh, the buyer writes that in. It could change because it says proposed lender, but it would give the seller some idea of, hey, who's the lender with? You know, the listing agent may say, hey, you know, if there's a multiple offer scenario, look at this proposed lender. Uh, here's my experience with these guys in the past. It might be a factor to be considered in a multiple offer with competing offers. If somebody had a strong lender and somebody had a lender that listing brokerage had some problems with in the past. And then check boxes for FHA, VA, conventional, seller, or other financing. Uh, the next line, an FHA, VA financing addendum, uh, which is on our website, uh, will be added to zip forms as well, is or is not attached. Additional financing terms are, are not attached. This would be probably for seller financing. And moving to paragraph eight, inspection rights. And again, this is kind of standalone in addition to financing appraisals and termites, mainly because if you use a due diligence addendum, we needed to have this separated. And again, this is a good point. We're about halfway through. If you have any questions, uh, we'll address them at the end and or you can email them to me at byron at screaltor.org. Inspection, reinspection rights. Uh, buyer and qualified certified inspectors are defined as inspectors can reasonably perform any reasonable, ultimately non-destructive examination and make reasonable record of the property with reasonable notice to seller through closing, including investigations of all site conditions and any issues related to the property at buyer's expense. That's your inspections. Let's cover uh, property, off-site conditions, um, puts the burden on the buyer. Buyer and persons they choose may make reasonable visual observations of property. It was really added off a hotline call where you had some, you know, sellers that were kind of pushing the envelope and wouldn't let, you know, the young buyer wanted their parents to come by and look at the property. It became an issue, so that, that's why that's there. 
Um, and then the next few lines are talking about utilities, really. Sellers will make the property accessible for inspection and not unreasonably withhold inspection excess unless otherwise agreed upon in writing by the parties. Seller is going to keep all utilities operational through closing unless otherwise agreed. The next line covers, you know, a classic REO type property, uh, which you're probably using a different contract anyway, but say you've got a vacant property um, and the power has been turned off, for example. The seller grants buyer permission to connect the utilities, pay for the utilities, hire professionals if the listing brokerage and the seller don't have it connected. And we recommend you hire professionals, electricians and plumbers, uh, to connect and operate the utilities during inspections, we've been getting some calls where buyer agents flip the main breaker or turn the water on and, you know, somebody, some copper thieves have come in and stole the uh, plumbing upstairs and all of a sudden there's water cascading down the stairs. So, uh, very dangerous for buyer agents to be turning on uh, power and electricity because of fire and flood risk. So, we recommend that you get a professional out there to do that. Um, or other, if the parties want to come up with some other situation, you've got a blank there. If you need space, you can attach it. A lot of these see attached we did for space savings. We're trying to get this form down as short as possible. It's at eight pages. Current one's at six. Uh, the original form was about double the size, so this has been refined. And some, so there are some space saving measures in here. And talk about liability limitations that I think you'll like uh, underlined here. I think you'll like buyer will hold harmless, indemnify, pay damages, and attorney's fees to seller and broker for, for all claims, injuries, and damage arising out of the exercise of these rights. A uh, seller will hold harmless, indemnify, pay damages, and attorney's fee to broker for all claims, injuries, and damages arising from the exercise of these rights. Brokers recommend the parties obtain all inspections as soon as possible. Brokers recommend that parties and inspectors use insurance to manage risk. Outline's gotten some calls where you had potential buyers fall, uh, get injured in property, so make sure that your brokerage is insured, that the owner has insurance, because uh, if somebody gets injured on that property, uh, their trial lawyer is going to be looking to get some money from you. Number nine, appraised value, and again, financing, inspection, financing, inspections, appraisals, and termites are all standalone contingency because we need that uh, to work with due diligence. And this was some of the feedback we got from Charleston that um, to keep that due diligence in the 10 to 15, you know, the shorter time frame, you need a standalone appraisal value. Otherwise, you're going to have a gigantic uh, due diligence period uh, to cover, you know, a buyer that wants to, you know, basically make their inspections, including appraisal. So that's why this is standalone. There's two options here. Uh, the first option, the contract's contingent on the property being valued according to the lender's appraisal or other appraisal as agreed upon by the parties, appraised value for the purchase price or higher. If the parties are made aware that the appraised value is less than the purchase price and the seller delivers notice, buyers within five business days are closing, whichever is earliest, of an amendment to reduce the purchase price, the appraised value, the parties agree to proceed under uh, to closing under terms of this contract for the purchase price amended to be the appraised value. This is really what we're doing now. Appraise is low. Uh, seller's got the option to reduce that purchase price down to the appraised value and move to closing. Uh, if he doesn't, then the buyer's got the option to buy it or to terminate. So that's what this next sentence is. Otherwise, buyer may proceed to closing, you know, and just go ahead and buy it at the price so they really want the property. Um, and we are kind of shifting to a buyer's market. I'm starting to get calls on the hotline about multiple offers again. So a lot of your agents that came in during the economic downturn uh, call the hotline, you know, they don't believe that it's legal or ethical to do multiple offers because they haven't seen a buyer's market, or rather a seller's market where you got buyers competing. So you may want to do some training on that. Or the buyer can terminate the contract by delivering notice of termination to the seller, whereupon the earnest money will be returned to buyer. Again, here's another area where we've gotten some help getting that earnest money out of your account. Uh, appraisal comes in low. Uh, seller won't reduce the price to keep everybody moving to closing. And the buyer decides, hey, I want to terminate. So they deliver their notice of termination, which will be a form to the seller, and then boom, you disperse their this money to the buyer. Our second option, this thing is not uh, contingent on the property uh, appraising. So, to, you know, uh, this contract's not contingent upon the property being valued at appraised value according to lenders, appraisal, other appraisal is agreed upon by the parties for the purchase price or more. And then number 10, wood infestation report. We talked about financing, appraisal, um, inspections, and termites being standalone, so we can use this with a uh, due diligence addendum. Uh, the property's been sold. 
or correction, the property has been sold or has been previously occupied, this contract is contingent upon the buyer and seller having the property inspected at their expense by a qualified inspector, bonded pest inspector, operator selected by buyer or seller, check the box. In delivery to closing of a CO100, um, and this is, the, you know, that 45, 30 days that we talked about on um, the CO100 uh, part of closing no later than 15 calendar days, and the buyer is responsible for having the property inspected. So basically, uh, this operates similar to what we're doing now. You get the uh, property, that's the second uh, paragraph. If there's damage by termites, the seller is going to remedy those, uh, make sure that the uh, termite letter is cleared, and make sure you get it reinspected by termite. Uh, I dated no earlier than 30 days prior to closing. And um, if the seller decides not to make the repair so they can't afford it, or they just don't want to make it, then the buyer again has the option to accept the property, negotiate, or terminate. And again, if they terminate, boom, earnest money's out of your account by contract. You return to the buyer once they deliver the notice. Um, and then it talks about some new construction there, um, how that's handled. 11, survey title and examination insurance. Uh, you want to, this basically recommends, hey, get a survey, get title insurance, get appropriate insurance. Um, and again, flood insurance is a big issue. You can see that, set, that last sentence there on page three, flood insurance uh, shall be assigned to the buyer with permission of carrier and premium prorated to closing. Buyers are solely responsible to investigate prices and requirements of insurance prior to signing contract. Paragraph 12, survival, basically the main change with this contract is the prorating taxes will survive closing. This basically says if uh, anything survives closing, you know, needs to survive, it does survive. 13 is basically what we're doing now. This is uh, the repair procedure. The buyer inspects the property. Paragraph A, you can see this blank here. You put a date in, and then if there's any repairs to the heating, the HVAC basically, plumbing, electrical water, wastewater, roof drill leaks, environmental concerns, structurally sound, uh, the seller um, gets to deliver notice of the defects uh, two days at, within two days after the inspection date. Um, and a lot of the current one doesn't have a lot of these triggers, so two days to get the inspection date, but there's no, in the current contract, there's no trigger for the buyer, the seller to respond to the buyer, so we have added that. That's paragraph B, seller's got five business days to get, a, you know, get some people in there, get some repair estimates on the costs uh, within five days. They've got to uh, agree or not agree uh, with the buyer on these repairs. If the uh, seller makes agrees to make the repairs, you move on to closing. And just like we're doing now, if the seller fail, you know, says, I'm not going to make the repairs, they don't want to or they can't afford to, then the buyer's got two business days um, to either buy the property anyway, they really want it, maybe try to negotiate some more, or to terminate and get the earnest money again. That earnest money gets that out of your account. So, and then we're getting into the, the main change uh, here is the due diligence addendum. This is uh, the parties would uh, buyer initial, initial date, seller initial, initial date, time. This is if due diligence is signed, dated in time by all parties. Parties agree the language in this due diligence addendum shall replace the prepare procedure language above in the section. Parties agree this transaction will be conducted in accordance with due diligence addendum. Gives the buyer the unilateral right to inspect the property and terminate for any reason with written notice and payment for a fee. So I'm going to switch forms on you and we're going to pull up the due diligence addendum. And this is the, uh, the new due diligence addendum. And this is the main change we made. This uh, uh, is used in other states across the country. It's, um, it helps protect you from uh, unauthorized practice of law, those people that are doing the homemade uh, due diligence phrases that we talked about, you know, contingent upon buyer's 100% satisfaction type language. And it basically says, there's a due diligence period, you know, you get the address to describe the property, and then in bold, the due diligence period ends no later than blank business days after the effective date. So the idea is that you've got a period for the buyer to do everything they want to inspect within that time frame, uh, on-site conditions, off-site conditions, you know, flood insurance rates, basically everything. And if they don't like anything, then they can terminate uh, by paying a fee to the seller to compensate the seller for time, time off the market. And during the due diligence period, these are the things the buyer can do any or all of the following. Uh, they're going to conduct and obtain inspections. They're going to deliver repair requests to the seller, uh, try to get an amended contract with the seller. Hey, lower the purchase price, pay for some of my repair, you know, whatever they work out. 
uh, they could proceed under an as-is contract. The seller says, uh, hey, I'm not going to make any of these repairs, take it or leave it, the buyer still wants the property. Or the buyer could say, hey, I don't like the price of flood insurance, or I don't like uh, those major structural issues. And even if you get you know, a company out here to fix the piers, you know, I just, that's just not something I want to buy. So I'm going to terminate. So this is the uh, termination paragraph here. Oops, sorry. Termination during the due diligence period, the buyer may unilaterally terminate this contract by delivering the seller both notice of termination and termination of fee of blank uh, good funds. So they're basically compensating the seller a predetermined amount. Basically compensates the seller for you know some foregone opportunities, properties under contract. It's showing as some sort of pending and MLS when the showings go down, so they kind of offset some of that uh, seller risk, you know, giving the buyer this unilateral right. Uh, the idea is the seller should be compensated somewhat. Um, and it talks about uh, the termination fee can be part of, you know, you can use some of the some or all the earnest money or you could just uh, bring the uh, good funds to the seller and pay the fee. And uh, again, here's another one to fix the earnest money. Once they deliver that with a fee, uh, you can go ahead and release the, uh, the earnest money. And then uh, in bold, should the buyer, this is the one where the buyer, you know, goofs. The buyer and buyer agent missed that deadline. Uh, they just bought the property as is. So very critical you make that deadline. Otherwise, you're buying the property as is. So you got a, a due diligence period to go in there, inspect, renegotiate with the seller, uh, move to closing in some manner, or terminate. Uh, if you just uh, didn't do what you're supposed to as a buyer or buyer agent, um, then uh, you have, then the buyer is bought to as is unless the par 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 parties agree otherwise. That's your due diligence addendum. Doesn't have to be used. That's just an option for you to use. Um, some of the uh, markets uh, like due diligence. Some are kind of worried about it that it gives the buyer too much power. Uh, that's why that fee was added in there um, to try to offset some of that for the seller having time off the market. Things like that. Back to where we were. Um, 14 home warranty. This basically allows the parties to say, hey, similar to what we're doing now, uh, home warranty is going to be ordered by, you write in who's going to order it. 12 months of coverage after closing date uh, will or will not be provided by closing, and blank amount will be paid by blank to home warranty. Buyer is going to pay for any deficit, say the home warranty was more expensive than that amount. Uh, if uh, there's a surplus, then whoever pays in this contract would get the uh, surplus. In the proposed, again, proposed, keyword proposed, home warranty type of home warranty. And we got some more NAR language further on uh, to protect you a little bit on that. And then kind of the worst case scenario, luckily uh, we don't get a lot of these calls. 15, if the property's damaged by fire or other casualty, hurricane, something like that. Uh, buyer's got six days, business days after notice, uh, to deliver notice of termination to the seller. If the buyer proceeds, then the seller is going to repair the damage or give the insurance money and pay the deductible. If the buyer or their inspectors cause the damage, then the buyer is going to be responsible for the damages. So. And then 16, residential property disclosure statement we talked about May 22nd. Get your comments in the LLR on the new seller disclosure. Listing agents, you really want to get a seller disclosure in there. There's some case law that says that if there's a seller disclosure, you cannot sue the, uh, the realtors. That's a good thing. Uh, 17, lead paint. Uh, we've been getting hotline calls. People bringing in old items like old mant antique mantles and things like that in a property that may bring lead paint in. This is kind of some what we're doing now. Megan's Law is really for sex offenders basically saying, hey, buyers, if you're interested in this, you need to go on that website and check that. Same for uh, you know, methamphetamine regist DEA registry. 19, similar what we're doing now, uh, it says that uh, you know this is where the interest uh, you can check, and then the broker can keep the interest. The broker could donate the money or keep the money to charity, could donate the charity or keep it. 20 is the state law where the uh, government, uh, South Carolina, has deputized the buyers to make sure uh, out-of-state sellers are paying their correct amount of South Carolina income tax on gain they make. Uh, similar to what we're doing now. 21 is a uh, part of your protections merger clause. It says this is the whole agreement. Um, adjustments we talk about. The big thing here 
This is adjusting uh, rents, real estate taxes, and a whole litany of things. The big change here is once that tax, you know, the attorney's going to try to prorate on taxes, but should that tax bill come out and somebody get unfairly uh, stuck paying too much or too little, the parties agree to come back together. It may diff be difficult to do, but it gets you as a real estate agent out of the middle of it. Say, look, here's what your contract says. You guys have agreed to settle up. Uh, it keeps you from getting mad at the real estate agent. 23 is really based on some court cases, trying to limit what uh, it basically said you could you could either terminate or sue. You couldn't do both, so this clarifies that. You can basically terminate, uh, you know, somebody's in breach and sue them and sue them for attorney's fees. Mediation clause, we talked about that. Very uh, valuable resource for you guys. If you want to be a mediator, Chicago class coming up in June. Uh, basically, people are going to try to settle uh, through mediation, settlement uh, through the local board, except for these issues below. 24 is a protection for you guys. Basically says if something's not part of this uh, agreement, uh, then the parties aren't relying on it. So that's why we cautioned about adding the MLS data sheet with that square footage in there, because otherwise it's not something they can sue about. Uh, 26, another protection basically says, hey, I'm a realtor, I'm a real estate agent, I'm really being hired for marketing, I'm not an expert on you know, schools or title, uh, property conditions, environmental issues, liability protection. Uh, 27, You'll like this one. This is the one where it says the parties direct the closing attorney to pay you guys your commission. If there's a dispute, say the seller gets mad and doesn't want to pay your commission, the uh, seller has agreed to pay a law firm to escrow that disputed amount and then try to settle it. If it's not settled within 180 days, then the money is dispersed to you guys. Um, and it also gives you the right to sue. Uh, say somebody breaches, it allows you to sue that party as well as your third party beneficiary. And another ethics protection for especially for buyer's agents says the parties represent their only agency agreements where the broker is disclosed in this contract. That's a pretty common ethics issue and this gives you another layer of protection. Say, hey, they told me they weren't being represented by another buyer brokerage and here they are, you know, representing it. So I uh, can't get me for ethics. And here's the NAR language here in bold. This is the NAR recommended language protect you by home warranty referral fees. Uh, 28 is a huge protection. There was a recent case that upheld this. Uh, you know, Nick and I have always been thinking, well, the courts would never hold, uphold something that says you're only liable for your, your commission, but it was upheld for a home warranty company, so it's in your contract. It says if you don't do something intentionally, uh, they can only sue you for your broker compensation if you were you know, negligent. So that limits your liability, and that's huge. The reason that's in italics, the court case actually said something about the internet italics, so it was a telesign. 29 is for attachments. Um, here, um, and we toyed with the idea of using check boxes, but that ultimately uh, realtors didn't like that. So you basically have a blank to describe the attachments. And this is mainly to protect people, you know, they're trying to do stuff they're not supposed to. Maybe have an attachment that they're going to tear off before they give it to the lender. Um, so you describe those attachments and it helps everybody communicate and know what, what's supposed to be part of the agreement. It's not. 30, notice and delivery, we talked about notice and delivery are defined, so here's where it's defined. Notice is a unilateral communication offer, counteroffer, acceptance, termination, unilateral request for better terms and association, addenda and amendments from one party to the other. Notice to or from a broker representing a party is notice to or from that party. All notice, uh, consents, approvals, counterparts, and similar actions required under this contract have to be in writing. It can be on paper or electronic, which is email or fax. Um, and will be effective as of delivery to the notice address, email fax written below, and awareness. So you're, uh, say you're a uh, listing broker, uh, your seller accepts the offer from the buyer or counter offer, uh, and you email that back to the buyer brokerage at the email address they've written on here, and maybe you follow it up with a phone call or you find out they were aware that they received that email, then you got uh, notice and delivery and a binding contract. 31 more protection for you from uh, unauthorized practice of law, UPL. Party is totally responsible to talk to their lawyer about legal advice, real estate licensees recommend you talk to a lawyer. Um, and then more protection for you, the parties acknowledge reading, receiving, and understanding A, this contract, B, your agency disclosure form from LLR, C, any agency agreements and copies. This keeps people from trying to file ethics and license law complaints against you guys. And parties acknowledge having time and opportunity to review everything and talk to their lawyers prior to signing. 
Uh, 32 is a little bit new. Uh, it enables you to set a deadline um, on an offer or counter offer. You basically have an expiration time and date on here unless the other party either counter offers or delivers uh, acceptance. Uh, witness, uh, you're going to have signatures, buyer, seller, and witnesses. If the signee is not a party, say they've got a power of attorney or it's a corporation, uh, we'd like you to attach the power of attorney or corporate authorization so it's either attached or it'll be delivered within blank business days to make sure that you've got the authority to do that. And then the seller or witnesses sign and date and time. And then there's legalese at the bottom with our forms policy or copyright. Not allowed to alter any of this stuff in this form. Or retransmit it, uh, or use it up, you know, for anything you're not supposed to, post on the internet, etc. Um, mainly so you can rely. Sometimes we get hotline calls where somebody's gone in with a word processor and made some big changes on here. And the idea that you want to have uniform forms is you don't have to read every letter and comma and period in the form. You can rely on what's in the uh, in the form. And this last page, this information page, is kind of new. We've added some stuff. You can see here the escrow agent. Acknowledgement signature, their name, if they're a law firm or some other sort of company or brokerage, their contact information, again, just so you don't have some sort of surprise escrow agency thrust upon you. And then below that is where the uh, both brokerages and their agents kind of tell who they are, what they're involved as, um, either buyer agent, seller, subagent, dual agent, buyer, designated agent, your licensee. And we've had a lot of problems with people not renewing their license and then practicing six, 12 months. You can get sued for that. So to try to help you keep up with that, you put your license number and your expiration date of your license. You know my bar license. I know my number by heart. We use it all the time. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty good with when it expires because it's annual. But you guys with this every two years, it's important you guys keep up with the expiration date for the licensee and your broker in charge. Brokerage company name. This will help. You get a lot of calls where licensees are jumping companies and doing stuff behind their former brokers' back. Where you're a member, this helps you know where to file arbitration requests for commission disputes, where to file ethics complaints. Also, again, you know, promotes that you guys are realtors. Uh, is more your branding. And then for notice, you got your address, which is probably going to be your company mailing address wherever you want to receive mail. And then where you want to receive emails and fax uh, for offers and counter offers, your mobile phone, office phone, and then if you want to add something else. And then goose for the gander, we've got the uh, same thing for involved as seller agent, seller sub agent, dual agent, uh, seller designated agent, licensee broker in charge, license number, expiration date, your company name, uh, what you're, where you're a member of the board of realtors, so you can file ethics or arbitration, whatever that is, promote your brand. And again, your notice for delivery purposes, your address, email, fax, mobile phone, office number. Other and then the last sentence there, uh, designated agency, the broker in charge, and other associated licensees are dual agents. So in designated agency, this is the one where they got a large brokerage, you got the buyer and seller as clients, uh, the broker in charge, and everybody else remains as dual agents. Broker actually, and this is all with forms, obviously, designates you know the agent working with that buyer as their basically buyer agent. And uh, the one working with the seller is their seller agent. So we're right at uh, one hour. Like I said, I'll stay on for any questions. Uh, better respect the people that you know knew this was an hour. We finished up here. So Mike, you got any uh, questions? Yeah. Um, the one person who uh, they said lenders are telling buyers not to include personal property as the underwriter will deduct from the loan amount. Right. This is a good good question, uh, a touchy question, a controversial question. Let me go back up to where it is, and we'll talk about that. That's an outstanding question. This, uh, this came up during our classes uh, last fall. So what they're talking about is uh, down here, you know, paragraph three, property. You got the description, the address, and personal property. And what the question is, say. Uh, and here, here's the most likely scenario. You've got a, you know, say a beach condominium. It's a rental property. It's full of furniture, pots and pans, television. You know, say, you know, thousands of dollars of personal property. Um, and the lenders are basically asking the real estate agents to conspire with the buyer and the seller, uh, basically to defraud the lender, uh, not put that information on the contract, uh, or you know, say it's worth a dollar, or or say something, you know. Really, that's 
in the purchase price, they're really paying for those items, the furniture, the pots and pans, the television. So I think it's very risky uh, for real estate agents and brokerages to go along with that. If you are pressured by a lender um, and, and you're going to try to do it, here's what I would recommend. Get that lender to put it into writing, um, you know, that direction, uh, and bring it up to the closing attorney. Put the closing attorney notice, hey, you know, the lender told me to do this. Here's what they wrote back. There's really, you know, you know, an estimate of, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars worth of furniture and appliances, uh, pots and pans, whatever the personal property is on that property that's really being conveyed for that purchase price. And the lenders ask us to basically hide that because the lender's going to try to sell it on the secondary market. And that, you know, and as we saw in the mortgage crisis, when people come down, these uh, foreclosure attorneys are now asking, you know, buyers, hey, did anything funky happen in your closing? And they're going to say, hey, my agent, uh, there's a whole bunch of furniture in there, and my agent told me just to conceal it from the lender. Uh, all of a sudden, now that uh, trial lawyers now got their hooks into you guys for some money. So uh, very controversial issue because I know you guys are under pressure to do it, but uh, I don't think it's a good idea to, to go along with that. Any other questions? Uh, the sale of property, this should be changed to successful close of property. Uh, sale could mean having a contract on the home to sell but not close yet. I'm, I, I think it's number two that they were concerned of with the purchase price up there. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think the uh, we talked about the addendums are going to cover that. Um, you know, they have all that language fleshed out in there, but good point. How long does the seller have to make repairs after notice following inspection? Sounds like repairs uh, need to be completed in less than a week. No, I, I, let me clarify that because uh, you still have the uh, the repair addendum that's going to cover that. What this is is in the current contract, and the situation is buyer does their inspection, say there's some say they got to repair, do some structural repairs, um, and then the repair addendum is obviously going to cover. Um, the time frame for the repairs. The parties would agree upon that. Well, this the time frame you're referring to uh, under repairs is the time frame to respond. So we're in paragraph 13, repair procedure. So you can see in paragraph A, there's a date there. So when you're negotiating, there's a date for the inspections to be completed. And then currently, what we I think it says 48 hours in the current contract says two business days. So after that inspection date, the buyer asks for repairs and the seller within two business days. Problem is in the current contract, there's no time frame for that seller to respond uh, to that repair request. So this adds a repair request reply deadline for the seller. It gives the seller five business days to get their contractors out there and see, say, you know, how much is it going to cost me to fix this uh, structural issue? You know, five thousand dollars. Okay, uh, I can do that. Or hey, I can't afford that. I'm upside down anyway. Uh, there's not enough proceeds, and I'm not going to make that repair. Uh, this basically says that the uh, uh, seller's got five business days to respond. It gives them uh, time to get their contractors out there and make a decision about that. Um, and obviously, if the seller says, yes, I'll do it, and they sign the repair addendum, and that gives you the time frame for the repairs, and you move forward toward closing. Um, and you can see in paragraph B, kind of like what we do now, the seller says, hey, I can't afford to make the repair, or I just refuse to make the repair. The buyer's got two business days to choose. The buyer can say, hey, I really want that property. You know, I'm, even though it's got, say, 5,000 structural damage, I'm going to buy it anyway. You know, just, I'll pay for it myself. Or they could try to negotiate uh, with the seller, say, well, what about $2,500 off purchase price or something? Or uh, the buyer could say, look, you're not going to fix it. I don't want to pay for it out of pocket. I don't want to accept the property with that structural damage. Uh, here's delivery of my termination notice. And then the broker can release the earnest money. Uh, will land and condo forms change in a line with residential? Um, um, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll they do. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be, be a uh, contract for you on the contract. Sure they match together. together. Um, so good point. Housekeeping on the form, paragraph six, initials for buyers, 
under at closing the word buyer is in there twice. Yeah, thanks for closing is at the end of April. The seller would be liable for four months of property taxes. If seller is 4% residential rate and buyer becomes 6% rate, would the seller have to pay a pro rata share of substantially higher tax rate? No, they're going to pro rate based on what they are. So closing it was first one. Two point one. And really, that's really there. You guys have to love it right now. Uh, you know, when there's, there's a problem, problem the tax bill will come at you guys. You guys maybe try to get some money out of you guys. This allows the broker to say, look, it's covered in the contract. Either settle with the seller or the other, other party because it could, could go, go, could cut both ways. The uh, seller could have got shorted, the buyer could have got shorted. Um, you guys need to settle up. You know, we can get you a mediator to help you. Otherwise, talk to your attorney, but it is covered in the contract. I did check you. Okay. Um, are you saying that the new language now in several of these items gives the broker in charge authority to release the earnest money without having to get the separate form then release signed by all parties? Yeah, great, yeah, great question. question. The earnest, earnest money, the problem we get now on these um, uh, earnest money disputes is really right now you only have a few options. You know, option A, uh, parties sign the release. And a lot of times parties don't want to sign a release, or maybe they would disperse the earnest money, but they still want to sue. So there's no form to cover that. They have to get their own attorney to draft that up. Um, so right now, you've got to get a release signed, or the parties have to go hire lawyers, sue each other, and bring your court order, or they got to mediate, pay for a mediator, try to mediate a solution, sign that, bring it to you. Or brokers can, you know, the broker holding the earnest money can sue the buyer and the seller under magistrate interpleader. Some brokerages choose not to do that because, uh, you know, you do have to pay filing fees. You do have to sit in magistrate court and wait your turn. Uh, so some don't want to do that. So the idea is license law allows you to disperse in accordance with the contract. So if something's clear, and again, it's not going to solve 100% of these earnest money disputes, but some of them that are clear, say, especially if you've got a due diligence addendum, uh, buyer terminates within due diligence. That's pretty clean cut. Contract says you can disperse, so license law allows you to. Obviously, if you're in a situation and parties start making noises about, you know, hiring lawyers or they dispute your agreement, call the hotline. We'll deal with it then. Um, but the idea is to try to give you some new tools. It won't solve all the problems, but it'll give you a couple of new tools to get clearance money out of your account. Good question. Um, are we going to add uh, in date at a minimum on the bottom of each page under the initial areas? Um, it's, it's not, not the, the current contract, current contract, contract um, doesn't, so, no, that hasn't been suggested. Uh, sex, uh, section 4 stipulates that property conveys with a general warranty deed. Some foreclosures convey with special warranty deeds, then what? Yeah, yeah, I think my mind, mind, that feedback we've been getting is foreclosures. foreclosures. Uh, the lenders, uh, not the lenders, the lien holders, rather, the REO, they have their own contract that's going to replace a lot of this. But uh, I wanted to, didn't want to point out something in here. Uh, good question. Let me get back up to it. And we're in paragraph uh, four, uh, basically on page two. It says, seller agrees to convey a marketable title with a properly recorded general warranty deed free of encumbrances and liens except here in fund state and ownership type and name uh, or stipulated by buyer. So the seller is signing this. This is another good example of why uh, seller is talking to their attorneys uh, before they sign it. This is an example of uh, you know potentially somebody getting sideways and trying to accuse you guys of unauthorized practice of law. So you recommend in this document uh, that you uh, you know, to get their attorney to look at it, they've signed it saying they've had time to talk to their attorney, but say they want to save some money, so they don't do it. Um, but they are agreeing to give a special warranty deed. And the feed, like I said, the feedback we're getting on REOs is that these uh, banks are basically putting an addendum or even a new contract that overwrites a lot of this stuff. Good question.
Uh, can you add in a line for insurance, taxes, homeowners associations, uh, et cetera, reviews under the due diligence list? Yeah, and the due diligence form questions about adding some sort of uh, insurance or taxes to due diligence talks about uh, do, during due diligence period uh, the buyer can conduct obtain inspections and let's go to inspections Paragraph 8, inspections. The buyer and qualified certified inspectors can reasonably perform uh, make reasonable work on property, including investigations of off-site conditions, and any issues related to the property. So any issues related to the property certainly would include property taxes and insurance. And, and kind of commenting on that, because I know this flood. flood insurance is going to be a huge issue. It's going to be a hot issue at the uh, NER mid-year meetings. You know, we're getting again getting stuff from all over the state. Some brokers in the coast have even sent some model addendums that we may adopt uh, to cover some of these issues because they're such a huge issue. Um, another issue that we've gotten, just kind of give you kinds of heads up on some of the addendums we're adding. Uh, a broker sent us a, a model form where you basically, and we ran this through the forms committee uh, recently, where the seller uh, basically rejects the offer, a counter offer from a buyer, and says, "Hey." Thanks for um, you know making the offer. I'm rejecting it. I'm not making a counter offer, but I am asking you. I'm inviting you to submit a new offer. You know, by the way, uh, when you submit your new offer, you might want to use highest and best terms. And here's some ideas, some terms you may want to include. And you could even use this form for a multiple offer, where with the seller's permission, hey, we've got multiple offers. Uh, all potential buyers can deliver their highest and best terms uh, at this time and deadline. And the uh, the seller may pick one or reject them all or counter off for one. So that's another form that we may have. But I think uh, going back to your insurance taxes, uh, I think they're already covered in this uh, inspection because it talks about in any issues uh, related to the property. That's uh, kind of like you can see it right here in paragraph A. Any issues related to the property? But like I said, we have gotten some model forms for this bigger waters, this flood insurance, where we're getting reports of you know a thousand percent increases, where it's almost cheaper in some cases to raise the property, that you know physically raise the house than to pay these uh, high insurance rates. And again, these insurance issues. If you're interested, keep in touch with Nick and Cashin. Uh, there'll be a town hall uh, next Tuesday, I think, for the NER mid-year, and I think it's going to be a huge issue at NER mid-year. Um, but keep stay tuned. Uh, j just to clarify, um, the release of escrow funds does not need to be signed if financing is not obtained. Yeah, let's uh, touch on that. Good point. Uh, we're talking about one of the tools that we've got uh, to get money out of your escrow account. Let's go up here to the financing contingency. Um, talk about. Um, Buyer's going to make a good faith effort to try to get their loan. Uh, it says uh, uh, they're going to apply and give pre-approval. And then it says um, if the sellers and brokers are notified of an inability to obtain financing during the finance period, any party, either party, uh, may terminate this contract by notice, uh, you know, deliver notice, and that'll be a form that we'll have. And then the earnest money shall be returned to the buyer. So, yes, you could, if they complied with that, and again, if you get uh, sellers start, or even buyers, because it says either party may terminate, you get somebody start making noises about, hey, I don't agree with that, uh, again, call the hotline 800-233-6381, email byron at screaltors.org, or email um, nick at screaltors.org, or even Michael Lee, and we'll take care of it. We'll talk about it. It may even, you know, if you get a situation where people are talking about lawyering up or filing some sort of ethics or license law complaint, obviously, you know, that, that answer may be tempered uh, to try to deal with. The idea is that buyer doesn't get their loan and they deliver notice within this time frame, no other breaches of the agreement, uh, you would be able to disperse the money out of your trust account. 
Uh, is the CL 100 outside of the agreed due diligence period, 45 uh, days to close, CL 100 to be within 30 days? Yeah, good, good question. question. I'm talking about paragraph uh, 10, and we talked about uh, with due diligence, um, the idea is originally everything was inside due diligence. You had to do everything, and some of the feedback we got was, hey, we like due diligence. We want due diligence to be a shorter time period. You know, North Carolina and Rock Hill, they see typically 10 to 15 business days. It could be longer. It could be shorter. But if you have financing and appraisal and termite within that due diligence period, what's going to happen is buyer agents are going to be forced to expand that due diligence period. So we've taken out financing to stand alone, taken out appraisal to stand alone, and termite to stand alone. This was especially important January 1st when Clemson changed that form uh, where it's only good for 30 days. So obviously uh, that's why that language is in there. Uh, no earlier than 30 days and no later than 15 days prior to closing. So that's why that's outside of that. And uh, one thing that came up yesterday in Charleston had a CL100 meeting at their association. The termite guy said, hey, you know, Formosan, subterranean termites, they can do a lot of damage and uh, two weeks. So, you know, 30 days, I know everybody, and hey, 45, 30, that's a big deal. But in, you know, real world, if you're dealing with termites, uh, you really even, they want it shorter than that. So, but the wood infestation report, financing appraisal uh, are all standalone for that reason. So if you were using the due diligence addendum, uh, and currently the wood infestations part of the repair and spec repair negotiations, but because this main form is designed to be used with that due diligence and in them, that's why wood infestation has been separated out. But it still operates the same as we do now. So if you did not use a due diligence, you're still basically in the same idea. You go in there, inspect, uh, and then the seller is going to agree to make the repairs or not make the repairs, and then the buyer can make their options about accepting, uh, negotiating, or terminating. Uh, should the property show as under contract in the MLS during the due diligence period? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a, a common hotline question about um, agents don't, you know, because obviously if you do anything but active, you know, the listing agents say, hey, showings just drop off the face of the earth, you know, they go down to zero sometimes. And that's really why we've got this fee in the due diligence addendum is to offset the uh, sellers, you know, because they're foregoing some opportunities because most MLSs don't allow you to keep it as active. You're going to have, and some MLSs have tempered that. They may want to come up with a new category. It says something like, you know, pending or contingent due diligence, maybe something like that. I know some MLSs have had some categories so people can realize what's going on with the property. Um, but most MLSs do not allow you to keep it as active once the seller signed that contract. But that due diligence fee that's why it's in there, because the seller is, hey, buyer's got a unilateral right to terminate the agreement and walk away. Uh, seller's foregoing some opportunities when they're, you know, their MLS is showing as something other than active, so that fee is designed to kind of balance it out. That fee, uh, you know, in the downturn, you know, you know, the Rock Hill people were talking about, you know, 100 or $200 just because, you know, it was a buyer's market as we shift. I think that fee could go up to something more, you know, market priced where you got a lot of people wanting to buy the property and sellers don't want to take the market off, so you could increase that fee. That would be part of your negotiation when you're setting the contract. Uh, if the inspection uncovers items not listed in 13A, does the buyer have the right to be released from the contract with a full refund on earnest money? Um, well, keep, keep in mind, mind we kind of talk about, you know, uh, kind of got two scenarios. So, say under the current contract, the buyer's got to look at, you know, major repairs, basically your structural, electrical, HVAC, plumbing, that sort of stuff. And while the buyer could always ask for those repairs, uh, the seller's only got to consider those major repairs if you're talking about termination. So if you don't have a due diligence addendum and the buyer says, hey, I want to fix a screen door, for example, uh, the seller can say, hey, I'll fix it, no problem. You, you know, you just add that to the repair agreement. Uh, but say the seller says, hey, I'm not going to fix that screen door. Well, the, the buyer does not have the ability to terminate uh, without exposing themselves to a breach of contract action. Now, if the buyer said, hey, I want you to fix the screen door and uh, the electrical system or the leaky roof, and the seller says, uh, 
okay, I'll fix all three, proceed. If the seller says, hey, I'll fix the electrical and the leaky roof, but I'm not fixing the screen door, uh, buyer doesn't have the right to walk away. But if the seller were to say, uh, well, I'll fix the electrical, I'll fix the screen door, but I'm not going to fix the leaky roof, then you're in the scenario where the buyer could uh, could terminate and get their earnest money back because that's a, a required, what we call a required repair. Yeah, if you're under due diligence, that's the beauty of due diligence for uh, the buyer point of view. Uh, anything they could, add, you know, they could decide to terminate for. So if they, uh, you know, they don't like the screen door being torn, they could terminate. Or if they found something else they like better, they could terminate. Or if they don't like the termite damage or the structural damage or the leaky, leaky roof, they could obviously terminate. Due diligence, basically, for any and all reasons, the buyer could terminate. And that's why it was controversial because a lot of people said, "Hey, that's giving way too much power to these buyers. Uh, the seller's taking their property off the market." Uh, it's not fair to the uh, seller. So some people aren't going to use due diligence. Uh, they don't. They don't like it. Uh, they don't think it's fair to the seller. Uh, but to try to balance it, uh, uh, the due diligence has a fee. So that's kind of the counterbalance. If you decided to use due diligence, and you could say the fee is you know zero or a dollar if you wanted to try to get free due diligence, I suppose. But the idea is that that dollar amount would represent some sort of compensation for the seller for taking the property off the market. So in other words, due diligence addendum, if it's not on, you're operating like you're doing now. You ask for the major repairs, seller makes major repairs, you're still in contract, seller refuses to make a major repair, uh, buyer's got the option to buy, renegotiate, or walk. Due diligence, completely different animal. If you're using due diligence, the buyer's got, uh, you know, could terminate for any reason they choose to. If they do it within the time frame and pay the money that they've agreed to, the seller uh, contract's over, and that money's designed to kind of balance things out, buyer had, you know, you know, could, change, could terminate for any reason, uh, and the money kind of puts, uh, makes uh, the seller a little bit more. When does the new contract take effect? Good question. It's got a July date on here. Um, we need to try to educate the uh, members. Last, the original idea was the forms committee approved the contract, the board directors saw it in September, so October, November, December. Uh, we're going to be education time frames for to go in January 2013. And when I started going around, a lot of the feedback, because it was a due diligence contract at that point, a lot of uh, pushback on the due diligence. So we changed that from education to soliciting input on the contract, incorporated a lot of that feedback into the contract. So I imagine we're going to need a time frame similar to that now. So we're talking May, June, July. So I think August at the soonest. Uh, maybe even we try to roll it out at the state convention. State convention will be September uh, 12th in Charleston, the Marriott Lockwood. Um, we've got a bunch of uh, education providers gearing up to help us with education. Uh, Charleston Trident's got a course approved with LLR, offering courses, CE courses on this contract and contracts in general May 31st and the last two weeks of June, depending on uh, demand. Uh, Coastal Carolina's working on uh, uh, a CE course. Uh, Diana Brothers, working with Western Upstate Association of Realtors, got a contract course approved similar to Charleston's. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have some dates on you for that, but it uh, would be available. And I know Sumter was working on uh, some education there. And some of the large brokerages, I know down in Charleston, uh, that were at that CO100 meeting, indicated that they were going to operate on some training for their members. So we do need to get the word out, so tell your colleagues about this. This webinar will be archived. So you can watch it any time in the future. Uh, we may, you know, depending on what Nick Kromitis, our CEO, wants to do, we may do some sort of SCR road show on the forum again. Uh, we may do another webinar. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, you can email Byron at screaltors.org on the forum or call us 800-233-6381. But I would say August, September timeframe is probably going to be a rollout date. Uh, and paragraph 13 uh, requires buyers to complete lender repairs. Uh, however, some underwriters don't allow that. Um, either way, no limit on this requirement uh, could be trouble for a buyer as no option as read, as a buyer has no option as written. Can you read that again, please? Uh, yeah, so paragraph 13 requires the buyer to complete uh, lender repairs. Some underwriters do not allow uh, either way, no limit on this requirement will be trouble as buyer has no option as written. Yeah, good, good question. question. I think the financing contingency would kick in at that point. 
Um, because if I go up to uh, You know, if the lender, you know, if there's some repair and the lender declined financing, then the uh, within the financing period, which runs up to closing, the buyer could terminate under the financing contingency. Um. Can we add something that says when the key should be dispersed upon closing or upon recording? Good question. Questions about um, keys. Really, the idea is that the that closing attorney is driving that. So let me get up to here where it talks about keys and things like that. We're talking about uh, paragraph four under conveyance. Um, it talks about seller shall convey possession of a vacant, reasonably clean property to buyer at closing. That's what they're talking about. Seller shall convey a possession and keys at closing, and then closing is defined. Closing uh, as defined occurs when seller conveys property to buyer and occurs no later than 5 p.m. closing date. So um, conveying the property so it defines when it's, uh, but the closing attorney would control that. All that stuff is basically keys, manuals, all that stuff, money, deed. You know, the way to think of that is that all is an escrow with the closing attorney. So closing attorney's control and that stuff gets dispersed. Um, even though we've got forms for seller to remain in the property post closing or buyer to remove in prior to closing. Um, and maybe it works out some of the time, but I'm on the hotline, so I get the nightmare calls. I've never gotten a call where that's worked out well. Um, sellers stay in post closing, then you know, move the box and there's a giant hole in the floor that, you know, the furniture or the box was hiding. Um, buyer moves in early, God forbid, you know, some sort of fire breaks out, you know, you got insurance issues, all that. Um, you know, maybe you guys have had good luck with using those forms. Based on hotline calls, I don't recommend uh, sellers stay in post closing or buyers moving in early. It just seems like asking for a lot of problems. What are certificate of assessments of buyer closing cost, but other transfer fees are broken out as? Oh, I guess this, I'm sorry. I guess is why are certificate of assessment, uh, buyer closing cost, but other transfer fees are broken out as negotiable. Well, really, the questions about uh, these uh, paragraph six transaction costs, you know, on the hotline, we, you know, because the old form uses the term closing cost, we'll get in a lot of uh, arguments about um, what things, who pays what. So the idea is to define it and then um, you know, option one is the buyers paying theirs, sellers paying theirs, uh, and then option two you check is where the uh, seller is going to pay, you know, $5,000, 5% of purchase price, whichever is higher, whatever kind of numbers you fill in those blanks with, uh, paying the non-allowables first and then the allowables with the uh, buyer uh, paying, you know, if it's not enough. And if it's too much, then whoever paid it gets the, uh, the money back. So that's how that works. Um, and then it's broken out under uh, private uh, public transfer fees. That's really not uh, certificate assessment. Certificate assessment's an RE county term of art. It's basically what happened was the HOAs, especially during the boom, uh, the closing attorney or their paralegal would contact the HOA and get a, a letter that basically said, you know, the owner owes us this amount of money or they're paid in full. And a lot of times they would give that to the law office or charge them, you know, a small amount. The attorney would just to eat it. During the boom, they were issuing so many of these because so many transactions were occurring. The HOAs, as a revenue source, started charging $150, $200 for these certificate of assessments. And they're really not called that outside of the Horry County. Um, so, but, uh, so it had to be inserted in the contract to cover that. Uh, Public-private transfer fees are a different matter. Uh, these are something that that's uh, sprung up 
uh, as the HOAs do the short sales and foreclosures have gotten strapped for cash, people not paying their uh, fees on time. Uh, there, some of them have tried to put uh, transfer fees in. Uh, SCR lobbied against private transfer fees, but some got grandfathered. And they've gotten creative. You can see there where they've come up. These are the terms I've heard. You may have heard new terms since this was written. Capital contributions, conservancy fees, estoppel fees. So kind of a catch-all or otherwise names, but similar fees paid to the owner's association are to be paid by the, are going to be the sellers of the buyer's transaction cost. Um, and really that's, uh, you know, because different markets handle it different ways. So you get to choose there. If you were to say they're the buyer's transaction cost, uh, then that gets covered if you were to choose that third option where the seller is going to pay, you know, X amount of dollars or percent of the purchase price. So. Is the new seller's disclosure uh, form that you were talking about uh, different than the one that we've been using, effective 1-1-13? One, one, uh -huh. That's an outstanding, outstanding question. I'm really going in depth because uh, uh, you know, you know, I was trying, trying to stay in an hour, but now that we're, you know, the people that are on here want to listen to it, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, vastly different. Kind of what the seller disclosure, kind of quick history, 2008. Uh, South Carolina Association of Realtors had a task force. We tried to update the seller disclosure based on hotline calls and some other issues. Uh, LLR shot that down. Uh, about 2009, I think, uh, 2010, uh, the Columbia Association, Central Carolina Realtor Association, approached SCR about teaming up to try to get an update to the seller disclosure. Uh, we met with it. We, we reactivated our 2008 task force, met with uh, Central Carolina Realtors uh, a couple times and uh, basically came up with a, a draft, sent it to LLR, and uh, LLR put it out for exposure and to get comments. And uh, then like, you know, as you mentioned, uh, late 2012, they approved a form. There were some issues with it about when it was effective. And also the Columbia Board uh, was a little bit upset because a lot of their comments that they sent to LLR were not incorporated. So. Uh, the Columbia Realtors and Real Estate Agents and one of their attorneys uh, in January went to the Real Estate Commission, this 2013, said, look, we sent you guys a lot of comments. You guys didn't include any of them. You know, we're not too happy. And oh, by the way, here's some things we see wrong with the form you did approve, LLR. Um, so LLR basically set up a task force and uh, this task force met. That was the one I mentioned with uh, Commissioner Realtor uh, David Krigler, uh, Realtor Fritzy Barber, uh, Realtor Jim Smith, a real estate agent from Columbia, Margaret Ann Ashburn, the AE from the Columbia Association, Sharon Young, and, uh, and uh, an attorney from Columbia, Gary Pickren, and the chair of that task force was Commissioner uh, Hamlin O'Kelly, and then an LLR staffer, Bo Tiller, Rod Atkinson were involved. They came up with a draft uh, that was proposed uh, to the Real Estate Commission. Uh, at their last meeting, Real Estate Commission put it on their website, so you can, it's pretty cool. You can actually go check it out and send comments to LLR. Major change, uh, they reorganized it in accordance with the statute, uh, and they asked us to kind of do the layout for them. So Sharon D'Elia works here at the association, real good at layout for our websites, uh, worked with Mike Crisp, uh, developed a form, uh, the layout using the uh, task force uh, content. So it's a real pretty layout. You may have seen it. Um, the main change is, because not all properties are under an HOA, uh, that is actually an addendum to the seller disclosure, so it's broken off. That's those HOA questions that were at the end of the, the 2013 seller disclosure. And keep in mind, back in January when the Columbia Realtors and Real Estate Agents and Attorney came in and said, hey, you know, why weren't our comments used, Real Estate Commission uh, to try to help them said, well, you can use either form. So right now you can technically use the you know, the 2012 form or the 2013 form. SCR said that's kind of dangerous to have two forms, and we asked real LLR to make to pick one, uh, and they basically uh, postponed that decision a little bit. Um, when I was in Charleston yesterday for the CL100, uh, the AE down there, Will Riley, expressed to me that the, uh, the Charleston board was going to get together, look at the proposed LLR uh, store disclosure and addendum that you can look at on the Internet by going to the Real Estate Commission website. They were going to write a letter to LLR and copy SCR. So I encourage you, and this is all got to be done before May 22nd. May 22nd is the next Real Estate Commission meeting. You could attend in Columbia. And if you send your comments to LLR, um, you know, LLR 
we'll be able to incorporate those. We've gotten some comments sent to us, uh, Nick Kremitis, Michael Lee, and myself, Byron King, are going to sit down, synthesize all those, and send those over to LR probably around May, mid-May, in preparation for that May 22nd meeting. May 22nd, the Real Estate Commission may approve this form. Uh, they may take into account some of these comments and say, hey, Task Force or Real Estate Commission, make these changes and then implement. But Or they might not make any changes. But uh, I think you'll like the form. The feedback we've gotten from the brokers that have seen it really enjoy it. The Columbia Board, uh, which is the one that had those comments that weren't incorporated by LR, they seem to like the form. So I think... Uh, yeah, I'm sure there'll be some tweaks, and in the future it'll be updated, but that's kind of to bring up the speed on some of these questions. Uh, for paragraph eight, uh, do we, is there supposed to be a checkbox in front of the second paragraph? Let me check. No, um, that's because uh, you got to have a default language. Um, so that if, you know, because if somebody forgot to check it, then you wouldn't have any agreement. So the contract says, uh, paragraph eight, uh, seller is going to make the property for inspection and not otherwise withhold inspection address excess unless otherwise agreed in writing by the parties. Uh, seller will keep utilities operational through closing unless otherwise agreed. So that's the default language of the contract. If you don't make any changes, and then you got two check boxes below. Uh, you know, say the seller, you know, it's a vacant property, for example, and they've shut the utilities off. And, you know, probably not a super common experience, but something that could arise. Uh, you check that, uh, seller's granting permission to connect the utilities, pay for utilities, hire professionals, electricians, and plumbers to safely connect and operate the utilities during inspections. Or B, maybe you check it, hey, seller's going to pay for all that, seller's going to get it hooked up. You know, what, and it is really a space savings thing that other, uh, you know, you could, you know, parties could agree to whatever they wanted to. If there's a long agreement, their attorneys want to draft something long, you put C attach, put an attachment. Uh, can any language in the new contract be overridden by an agent? Um, well, we talked about one of the reasons that we drafted this form is the unauthorized practice of law. It's a felony crime in South Carolina. It's an ethics offense under Article 13. It's a license law violation under South Carolina license law. So SCR recommends that any changes made to this contract be approved by your brokerage attorney or the buyer or the seller's attorney, um, unless you're an attorney and there's some attorneys that are real estate brokers and agents. Um, but if an agent were to change the language in the contract beyond just filling in, you know, purchase price and names. There's a real chance that um, if something were to go, here's kind of worst case scenario, you do something like that, somebody gets damaged enough or they go out and hire a lawyer uh, to say the buyer's going to sue the seller or vice versa. Because that case law we talked about, you know, that home equity line of credit, if a lawyer's defending a breach of contract lawsuit, you know, based on that case law, they've got an incentive to say, hey, real estate agent changed this language, real estate agent committed the felony crime of unauthorized practice of law, real estate agent violated license law by practicing law without a license, real estate agent violated their own NAR Realtor Ethics Article 13 for the unauthorized practice of law. Uh, based on this home equity line case, uh, the contract's void, so you can't sue us for breach of a void contract. So you've got a party with a lawyer with an incentive to defend it, Say that. Say somebody was, uh, you know, in fact, sometimes make unusual law. Say somebody was damaged and it kept getting appealed, court of appeals, or in, even the, the worst case scenario, it gets to the South Carolina Supreme Court because they're the ones that determine what practice of law is, and they've not opined on, uh, you know, real estate agents filling in paragraphs in the contract. But if you were to make changes without a bro without an attorney approving them, there's a real chance if somebody were damaged and got the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court would say, hey. We've already opined that a real estate closing is the practice of law. That's why we don't have title companies in South Carolina for closings. And the contract is the main document that controls that transaction. So we think that contract uh, creates legal rights for people and uh, real estate agents without a law license changing language is the unauthorized practice of law. If that were to come down, I mean, we're work we would be looking at spending millions of dollars to try to get some sort of constitutional amendment uh, to override the Supreme Court because there's no other way to override them. Or we're looking at real estate agents doing like they do in, you know, some northern states where you don't fill in any blanks. You basically, you know, buyer agent, once you get a buyer rate offer, 
you take them over to your friendly neighborhood uh, buyer uh, lawyer. Uh, buyer pays the lawyer, you know, three thousand dollars to fill in the blanks and send it to the seller's attorney. And the seller's attorney charges the seller thousands of dollars. And you know, back, you know, while they're negotiating, you know, fees can go up, uh, delays can go up. So, really, really strongly encourage you guys not to do more than fill in the blanks with uh, information, not sentences, and that you do not get a word processor and change some of the type language if you change any of the type language, this document's copyrighted, uh, you'd be in breach of the copyright, and you need to really make it clear that there's been a change uh, to that contract. Uh, if you were to go down that road, you know, as far as you probably need to even remove all our logos, all the mentions of SC Realtors, Association of Realtors, you probably need to highlight, bold, underline whatever changes you made, because what's going to happen if you made a material change and the other brokerage relied on this being a uniform document, a standard form, and you tricked them like that. That could be also, you know, a lawsuit, an ethics violation, a license law violation, and you know, scary. It could be a felony crime. And I used to think, hey, you know, Nick and I are maybe overly paranoid about this, or we're chicken little. The sky is falling. But all that changed when we had a, a upstate real estate agent accused of the pra unauthorized practice of law by me. Uh, if a listing agent gives a buyer's agent written permission to turn on the utilities, uh, example, flip main breaker, and if there's a uh, subsequent issue, can the buyer's agent still be held responsible? I think, I think, I think so. I mean, this I know it's common practice. Uh, I get calls all the time about buyer agents going into some vacant house and flipping a breaker on, or you know, maybe they got one of those keys and they go out in the front yard and turn the water on, especially with this, uh, you know, these. Uh, drug addicts uh, are just thieves breaking in and stealing copper pipes or copper wiring. Um, God knows what they've done. Air conditioning unit, uh, you know, and you go in there, flip a switch, and it starts a fire. Or like we talked about, real world example, you know, they'd stolen a toilet out of the upstairs and a bunch of piping, and the the fire agent turned the water on, and water came pouring out of all the pipes and flowing down the stairs. I think. Anybody that's touching those uh, main breakers or main water cutoff, if something bad happens, if it was my house, you know, I would look for you or your insurance company to try to make me whole on that. So strongly, and God forbid, a uh, buyer agent flips that main breaker and there's some sort of shortage with a breaker box and you get electrocuted. So um, I really strongly encourage buyer agents uh, not to go out and turn utilities on. Um, I know it's commonly done. It adds some cost. Um, you do a risk analysis, you know, what your brokerage is willing to absorb as far as risks. Um, but if you, you know, you're talking to a lawyer, so if you want to minimize your risk to zero, you know, you hire an electrician or a plumber to come out there and you know, hook it up. And if something bad happens, you know, you hire a reputable company with a bond. And then if you get sued, then you drag the electrical company or the plumbing company into it. It's, uh, the certificate of assessment, the same thing as a real estate transfer fee. Sorry if you already answered this. Yeah, that's a good question. The uh, and one reason I defined, uh, or you know, the forms committee defined the certificate of assessment. It's really a term, really only used in um, Horry County, um, and it's caused a lot of confusion over the years. It was a, you know, I get a lot of hotline calls still about it because uh, assessment sounds some, like some sort of a tax document. Um, and it's not. It's the uh, the letter that the um, that the uh, HOA is giving the closing attorney that states um, you know how much is owed on the property. So I, I don't think it uh, falls under the um, transfer fee. The transfer fee is really uh, their grandfather now because SCR made private transfer fees illegal. Uh, basically, because what happens at an HOA, they basically say, hey. You know, we got to do you know a hundred thousand dollars worth of exterior work or road work or lighting or whatever whatever the expense is going to be. So they go to the owners and they say, "Hey, we're going to assess all you guys X thousands of dollars to do this, or you can vote to start some sort of transfer fee uh, on the new properties." And so, you know, most of the owners, if they're not going to move, they might vote, "Hey." Stick it on the new guys. Don't charge us. So a lot of those things got implemented. There was a lawyer in Texas that even came up with this uh, 
I, I call it, you know, it was sold in Wall Street. Basically, what they're trying to do is create a never ending uh, transfer fee on the property. And they were bundling that and selling it, you know, as securities on Wall Street. Um, and it was going to create extra cost to the transaction and closing attorneys, maybe not now, but 10, 20, 100 years from now, you know, tracking down who to pay that fee to would be, become a nightmare. So a lot of states have banned private transfer fees. Some of them are already in place. They're grandfathered. Public transfer fees, uh, there's some grandfathered ones. For example, Hilton Head's got uh, public transfer fees for green space. So but what the HOAs are doing is saying, hey, it's not a transfer fee. It's a capital contribution or a conservancy fee or an estoppel fee or whatever name they dream up. Uh, to call it faster than we can name them. That's why that catch-all or otherwise name, but similar fees uh, paid to the owners association is in there. And uh, in different markets, handle it different ways. In some markets, the sellers typically pay it. In some markets, the buyers pay. So you got that choice there. And even if you choose there, so you choose it's a buyer transaction cost. If you check the next paragraph, uh, where the sellers pay in some of the buyer transaction cost, it might even cover some of that. All of them. But if you think of any, I know some of you, uh, you know, your co tell your colleagues to look at this webinar in the future. If you have any questions, you know, contact SCR, um, phone number here, 800-233-6381, uh, emails byron at screaltors.org, uh, Nick Kromitis at uh, screaltors.org, and what's Michael Lee's in? Just uh, Michael at screaltors.org. We got two Michaels here. Mike, thanks, Michael Chris, who's been uh, my producer. Uh, Sharon DeLeo did the layout on the seller disclosure. Take a look at that seller disclosure. Um, have your colleagues look over this document. If you need CE to get licensed uh, by your June 30th deadline, and keep in mind that original A through K, L through Z uh, renewal rule is not 100%. So go on LLR's website, check your license expiration, check your if your broker in charge, check your licensee's expiration dates. If you need CE, uh, contact your broker, contact Charleston, Sumter, Western Upstate, Diana Brothers, Myrtle Beach, Coastal Carolina Association of Realtors, because some of them are going to offer CE that's on this form where they go in and teach you some things about contracts, teach you about this form. You've got zip forums. I include Zip Vault, Cloud Storage, Zip Mobile, so you can use your uh, iPad uh, with clients, have them sign with their fingertips. You've got uh, Digital Inc. where you can email secure signatures to parties out, out of town, out of state, out of country. Save on UPS, FedEx shipping costs. Uh, Mike, anything else we got for And we'll see you in uh, September in Charleston Annual Conference. Um, yes, uh, good question. Uh, Nick Kremitis approved. Uh, what we'll do is send out a mailer with the uh, this form and a link to this webinar and probably some other information. That'll come out sometime after this webinar, probably this week or next week. Yeah, um, we'll also make sure to post a copy of this form on the form's website uh, on screaltors.org. If you go there and then go to the standard uh, zip forms and standard contracts page, it uh, will be posted there separately from the other forms on the top uh, just for your review. Uh, make sure you don't use this form until uh, it's been approved. So. Yeah, yeah, great point. Uh, the website's got information on our forms are there if you're you know kind of old school. But I encourage you to, we've got training videos on the zip forms, get you and your agents up to speed on zip forms. It'll make you stand out from other agents. It'll increase your efficiency. And again, like Mike said, uh, this form is not... Uh, uh, put out for publication for use. Uh, we put this warning on the form and verbally, but last fall when I was going around, I would get hotline calls, you know, one or two where somebody tried to use the uh, draft form in a transaction. So this might uh, void your ENO coverage. So I, I don't use this till we uh, implement it yet. Thanks.